The current situation between Iran and the United States is serious. It is clearly the most serious situation since our rivalry with the Soviet Union uh, up through the early 1980s. Uh, it is serious because uh, we are threatening them with first use of nuclear weapons. Uh, the plan for Iran is targeted military strikes uh, from the air targeting nuclear facilities to um, create instability in Iran that would lead to an internal takeover. So it wouldn't need more troops. It's basically what it needs is the will to move forward on it. The Bush administration has the will. We can see that the administration is doing the same damn thing that it was doing to get us into that horrible war in Iraq. And that is, it's, it's putting out propaganda, it's misleading the public. Well, Vice President Cheney stood on an aircraft carrier 150 miles off the coast of Iran today to deliver a blunt message. We will stand with others to prevent Iran from gaining nuclear weapons and dominating this region. Why is the U.S. government trying to start a war with Iran? Basically until 1979, U.S. and British oil companies owned most of Iran's oil. In 1979, with the Iranian Revolution, uh, the oil companies were kicked out. Um, since that time, I think it's safe to argue that U.S. and British oil companies and our governments have felt that that oil really belongs to them and have been trying to get it back. Um, it's a tremendous amount of oil. Oil is not just about the profits that would be yielded to oil companies if they owned the oil, although it is a lot about that. It's also about the global power garnered by who controls the last bits of uh, global oil supply. Two-thirds of the world's reserves of oil and natural gas is in the Middle East Central Asian region. The largest is in Saudi Arabia, the second largest in Iraq, and the third largest in Iran. Control of this region has been policy since the U.S. emerged a new world power after World War II. In order to dominate the world, we must control the world's oil and we must not tolerate countries that show how independence and defiance of the U.S. is possible. Plain and simple, the U.S. agenda is world domination. Please, Chick, that hurts. Don't do it anymore. Are you going to be on my side if I let you up? Sure, Chick, sure. I'm on your side. Just set me up. I'll do anything you say. Controlling oil means you have a stranglehold on the world economy, and you have a stranglehold on countries who use oil, either they depend on it for their economy or they import oil. The U.S. established business and military partnerships with the dictators in the region. The Saudi royal family in Saudi Arabia. Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And the Shah in Iran. The countries and their oil were under control, but with Iran and Iraq, control was lost. Something had to be done. After September 11th, 2001, the United States, the Bush regime in particular, launched a, a campaign, a sort of an unbounded uh, unending war for greater empire under the rubric of a war on terror. Uh, the architects of that envisioned creating an unchallenged and unchallengeable U.S. empire. These neocon theorists argue that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that without the Soviet Union, without this nuclear-armed uh, superpower confronting the United States, the U.S. reigned 
unchallenged militarily. And if it did not act decisively, new challenges would emerge and it would go the way of other empires. I mean, the Russian Empire has collapsed twice in the 20th century. The Austro-Hungarian, the French, the British. Empires rise and fall increasingly quickly and people like Paul Wolfowitz, like Dick Cheney, like Louis Libby were very aware of this. So when September 11th came, they seized on this attack. They felt they had a political opening. Again, once in a lifetime, George Bush writes in his diary that night, this was the Pearl Harbor of the 21st century. A once in a lifetime opportunity to launch this boundless war to reshape the Middle East and the whole world. The U.S. invaded Iraq and removed a brutal dictator from power a dictator that we supported through his worst crimes. Saddam Hussein was our ally until he stepped out of line and invaded Kuwait without our permission, turning him into an instant enemy. To regain control, we invaded Iraq. Attacking Iraq was a war crime. There are only two instances in which war is legal. UN authorization, which the United States didn't have, or an imminent threat. Neither one applied. This was actually under the Nuremberg standards a war crime, a, a, the crime, the supreme crime of aggressive war. That's what this is. And of course, one of the ways I think the discourse in this country is so corrupted is everyone talks about this war as a mistake. No, it was not a mistake. It was a crime. This was a war carried out for very specific and conscious political and economic objectives. It wasn't an error. It was a crime. And the same situation applies with regard to Iran, an attack on Iran. Whatever the level of development of their nuclear program is or isn't would be a war crime. The U.S. government is guilty of theft and mass murder. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people have been killed millions displaced, and a hundred thousand fleeing Iraq every day in one of the most severe refugee crises on the planet. And a key benchmark for withdrawal is a passage of a law putting ownership of the country's oil into the hands of a few multinational energy corporations. The only actors at this point that are likely to uh, win the war in Iraq are U.S. oil corporations uh, and oil industry uh, folks. Um, that's because the Bush administration has spent four years trying to uh, change Iraq's oil industry from a nationalized model that before the war was essentially closed to U.S. oil corporations to a privatized model um, where essentially uh, almost the entire Iraqi oil sector would be open to private foreign corporate ownership. Um, and they've the Bush administration has been trying to do that through passage of a new oil law in Iraq so that an Iraqi government would pass the law, the law would then be legal, and the Iraqi government would then sign contracts with U.S. oil companies making it all on the up and up. Um, so the slow process has been trying to get in place the right Iraqi government and then get the law passed in Iraq. Um, the law is truly radical. Essentially it would say before the war U.S. oil companies didn't have access to Iraqi oil. After the war and the occupation, U.S. oil companies own the vast majority of Iraq's oil. Fairly successful uh, uh, use of a, of a military for the, by the interests of the U.S. oil uh, corporations. Well, we're only advisors. You make your own laws. But I think you'll find that your new law 